pleasure to be here uh, with you online today for this uh, for this webinar. So uh, just uh, before we kick off with the overall agenda, I just wanted to maybe provide a few words of introduction to the International Trade Center. We are a joint WTO UN organization based in Geneva, Switzerland, and we focus on the internationalization of small and medium sized enterprises. And we have been working with DG Trade of the European Commission to develop and implement a project called the EU Cities for Fair Ethical Trade Award. And the idea is of this project is really to uh, raise awareness about the actions that specifically EU cities are taking toward the, uh, the direction of championing fair and ethical and sustainable trade. And so why, why is ITC as a UN organization involved in this award? Well, put simply, we at ITC strongly believe that values-based trade, what we call good trade, can help steer society toward more responsible consumption and indeed production. And we can bring, if you will, more sustainable opportunities to people in other countries uh, and, and, and not only in, 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 the European, uh, in the European Union, but, but internationally. So the award that we are developing really provides a platform and a framework for cities to get involved, to connect and to learn from each other and to show how they're contributing to in their own ways toward what we consider what we call good trade. I should note that an important aspect of this award is the implementation of a development cooperation project between the city of Ghent the city of Ghent won. They were the winner uh, of, the, of the, uh, the first edition of the award in 2018. So the winning city of Ghent in Belgium and uh, the municipality of Sanaval uh, in India. And so there was a selection process, an open call of interest, and Sanaval was, was selected uh, by us, Ghent and, and DG Trade, to be, if you will, um, the, uh, the third country partner for this, for this development cooperation project. And the idea of this project between Ghent, between the municipality of Sanoval and also the, the larger, let's say, Ludiana metropolitan area, is really to promote a peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, on sustainable consumption on the Ghent side, and then sustainable production, if you will, on the, on the side uh, in India. Uh, and the project focuses specifically on the garment and textile sectors. Uh, and why is this? Is because obviously, uh, you know, in, in the case of Sanaval and Ludiana, textiles and garments are a significant part of the economy. Uh, and there are obviously sustainability issues that are linked to this sector. And, and obviously, this sector is, is, is housed within a city or a municipal environment. So obviously, these whole issues together of fair and responsible and ethical trade uh, are, are, are completely, uh, are completely, if you will, uh, let's say related. And then also Ghent, from its history, um, uh, has been in, 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 in previous years, many years ago, uh, a very, very strong textile manufacturing uh, region and, and, and city. So indeed, both, both, uh, both Sanaval and, and this in the region in, in India and Ghent uh, have been called, uh, the, you know, the, the Manchester's of their of their of their location. So Ghent, the Manchester of, of continental Europe, and then if you will, uh, Sanaval, Ljubljana, the, the Manchester of, of, of India in terms of the, the, the textile production there. So there are a lot of, let's say, interesting, uh, interesting parallels. So today we're really looking uh, specifically at uh, a interesting way to talk about sustainability from an environmental perspective uh, that really is focused at the industry. Uh, and, and we're going to be kind of splitting the webinar into two, into two parts. The first part of the webinar will really focus on some approaches that we at ITC have developed related to sustainable uh, production when it comes to textile and garment manufacturing. So tier one and tier two, let's say units uh, in, in, the, in the supply chain. And we're looking specifically at resource efficient and circular production type methods that deal with how to reduce inputs such as water, uh, electricity, chemicals, uh, and other inputs in order to become more resilient. And, and why is this resiliency important? Well, it's, it, it's in, it's, the resiliency is important for economic reasons. It's important for environmental sustainability reasons. It's also, in, it's also important to meet uh, increasingly stringent requirements from buyers that are very conscious about the environmental conditions in which they're inputs into the garment manufacturing uh, chain are, are produced. And last but not least, it's also quite relevant in a time of COVID when, when margins are, are, are squeezed 
and economic resilience and efficiency is, is, is paramount in people's minds in terms of how to, how to survive uh, in, in these types of, of, of difficult days. So um, the first part of the webinar will deal with this and my colleague Anna Battaglione from our team here uh, at ITC will take us through the methodology that we've implemented and some of the results and, 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 and findings that we have uh, established throughout our project work uh, in various countries. Then we'll break for a Q&A session, and so we can have questions and answers related to this methodology. And then we will have the second part of the webinar, which will be really focused and dedicated toward the issue of COVID and, and how COVID has been affecting global textile and garment supply chains uh, from a kind of a macro level, but also we'll have a, have a view of, of specific issues that are COVID related to the India uh, textile and garment reality. And so for this section, the second part of the webinar on COVID, I will be joined by two of my colleagues. One is Matias Canape. Matias Canape is a senior policy advisor here at ITC that works in the textile and garment value chain uh, projects. And he has a lot of experience globally on this. And so he'll share his views and comments on, on the impact of COVID from a global perspective that also goes downstream to the brand and the retailer perspective. And then also we'll focus closer to home in India with our colleague, uh, our colleague Varun Baid from Wazir Advisors based in Delhi, who will provide also his views and, and, and insights in, as to um, how COVID is really affecting the India uh, textile and garment sector with, with the focus also on the, on the, on the, on the Ludhiana and Sanibal area. So, and then after, after Varun and Matthias uh, also provide their interventions, then we'll also have a Q&A session specifically related to that, to their, to their, uh, to their interventions and points. I should note uh, in terms of the, the kind of modus operandi of the webinar, uh, we can do the Q&A via the chat box. And that way, you know, you, anyone can write their questions as we go. So you don't need to wait until my colleague Anna is finished speaking or until Varun or Matthias are finished speaking. You can actually type your questions straight away into the chat box. And then uh, my colleague Petro Walterova, who's also with, with us on the webinar today, will be able to kind of do a triage and, and, and do the Q&A uh, after A, the first section with Anna, and then B, the, the, the section with Matthias and uh, and Varun. So uh, I would say just also in terms of let's say Zoom meeting. I mean, now these days we've been we've been Zooming for the past whatever four months now. So I'm sure we're we're, we're quite attuned to Zoom etiquette. Uh, so please do keep your microphones muted and your and uh, if you're not speaking or my colleagues that are speaking, you can keep your videos on. But those that are not speaking, uh, please turn your videos off uh, and then we'll make sure to have a proper bandwidth. So at, without further ado, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give the word to my colleague Anna who will now um, share her PowerPoint screen uh, or PowerPoint presentation, I should say, related to the uh, resource efficient and circular production presentation. So thanks very much, everyone. And Anna, over to you. Thank you very much for this introduction, Joe. Um, I will share then my screen with, uh, with all of you. Um, just a moment. Uh, can you let me know if you can see it well? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, great. So, well, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. As Joe mentioned, my name is Anna Battaglioni and I am a project manager at the Trade for Sustainable Development Program of ITC. It's my pleasure to be here with you in this webinar and share some insights uh, related to resource efficiency and circular production in the textile and clothing sector. So my presentation is structured in four parts. First, we will look at what is resource efficiency, what is circular economy, and why actually it matters for business. Then we will also look into some global market trends related to the textile and clothing sectors following with some examples based on previous work of ITC in resource efficiency and circular economy, uh, examples of actually cost-saving production practices specific to the textile and clothing sector. And uh, in the final part, we will have a Q&A 
as explained by Joe. So if you have any comments or questions, please uh, type in the chat box and uh, at the Q&A, uh, we'll be able to discuss. So let's start with the why. Yeah, so why do we need to talk about resource efficiency and circular production? As you can see in this graph, uh, demand for resources is increasing at an unsustainable pace. And we also need to think that all consumer products that we use, they are based on natural resources, meaning that we are pretty much uh, dependent on uh, resources to produce, but also to consume. And uh, the depletion of these natural resources, they have a number of consequences, bad consequences to the economy, to societies, but also the environment. And when I talk about uh, resources, pretty much uh, we can include in this basket uh, metals, but also biomass, no metallic um, elements, but also fossil fuels. And if we think of these consequences, the economic and environmental consequences, for instance, the ongoing extra extraction and use of agricultural land will tend to increase the pressure on resource prices, uh, which affects uh, the access to resources, but also the commodity prices. On the environmental side, uh, there are many pressures that are caused by the depletion of these resources on the ecosystems, but also on the climate. And then we have, uh, we see an aggravation of um, weather phenomenon, but also uh, issues such as biodiversity loss. And thinking a bit more on the negative consequences for the environment. Uh, for instance, you see in this uh, diagram, some examples of this negative impact such as 33% of the world's soil are moderately or highly degraded, and this is caused by resource depletion. Or even if we think on the global population, which nowadays is over 7 billion humans, uh, and we actually represent as humans, this is an interesting fact, we are less than 0.01% um, in terms of the, all the species in the, in the, in the planet we represent only 0.01%, but still uh, humans, they have caused the loss of over 80% of the wild mammals and half of the plants. So the impact is definitely there. And the question is, what is the role of the private sector? What can companies, what can uh, multinationals, buyers, and also consumers, what can we do to tackle the issue and to minimize the negative consequences. So companies, especially the small and medium-sized ones, they are severely impacted by climate change and environmental degradation. Uh, for instance, a company can be impacted by the decreased productivity in the agricultural sector, if we think of a cotton plantation, or it could be also suffer, um, consequences related to disruption of supply chains caused by weather phenomena. So in an ideal scenario, companies, they would also uh, be able to support an economic model that uh, contributes not only to minimize neg negative environmental impacts, but also potentially generate a positive e effect on global and local level. And very interesting, interesting uh, is the information in this small image that we are currently using up the renewable resources of 1.7 planets. And if society, governments, companies, they do nothing, um, they, we will need actually three planets by 2050. So having a, a with this overall picture in mind, then we need to think, okay, but then what is resource efficiency? So resource efficiency is about using the limited resources of the planet in a sustainable manner uh, that minimizes the impact on the environment. So it's about consuming and also managing resources such as water, energy, chemicals, and also how you dispose and you treat your waste uh, in a way that 
not only reduces, but also uh, it creates incentives to recycle, to reuse uh, byproducts or waste that come from a production facility, for instance. And resource efficiency and circular production, RACP, they actually translate into more efficient operations at the factory level or the company level uh, with a very good potential to reduce costs, production costs, and in this way save, um, yeah, save uh, resources, but also increase the competitiveness of a company. And the next step is then looking at what is the circular economy about? What is the circular production? And once we have resource efficient measures in place in a company, in a government, uh, yeah, in a specific uh, project, then we can talk about systematizing a model of circular production. So one leads to the other. We need circular, uh, we need resource efficient measures to build a circular economy. And the circular economy is, uh, is about a model of production and consumption that involves sharing, leasing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing, recycling existing materials and products as long as is possible. And in this way, we have uh, the life cycle of a product can be extended. And also you can reduce the amount of waste that is produced. And what you see here is actually the ideal model of how we will transition from a linear economy to a circular economy. And actually the resource efficient and circular production practices uh, that your company could implement, they contribute to this shift from an um, economic model that is based on taking, making and disposing a product to one model, the circular economy model that follows uh, an approach of making, using, but also recycling. And, uh, products, uh, byproducts of the production or final products. In this way, you sort of close the loop of production and the life cycle of such product. And the linear economy, in fact, uh, it follows this traditional approach of you extract the resource, then you produce the product, then you dispose. So this is step-by-step -step plan that is linear. Uh, it means that raw materials, they are collected, uh, then they will be transformed into products that are used until they are finally discarded as waste. And then we can think also like that could be um, the model of textiles and clothing. So after we, we uh, don't see a use anymore for our clothing, we might just likely dispose it in the waste. And it does not close the loop in that sense. And in a circular economy model, for instance, it follows the approach not only to recycle, but also to reduce your consumption of the resource and also reuse it. So these are the three R's that you can see uh, also in the slide uh, related to reduce, reuse, and recycle. And by reusing a product, uh, you actually maximize its uh, life cycle uh, and you can also uh, reuse raw materials, but also recycle them in a high standard and convert into uh, a new product, or it can also be used in services. Then the question you might be asking yourself right now is, well, okay, so how can I implement the circular production and the resource efficiency model into um, the textile and garment sector. So there has been a lot of research done in the last years regarding how a circular economy model would look like for the sector and pretty much uh, the main conclusions, the takeaways of these studies. Uh, it's based on four main ambition, ambitions for the sector. The first ambition relates to phasing out substances of concern and microfiber release. 
Then a second step would be to increase clothing utilization. And here the consumer has a big role to play as he is the, actually the agent that is uh, consuming the clothing and the textiles. Uh, the third ambition relates to radically improving the way we recycle, companies recycle, uh, the industry recycle and transform clothing design, uh, collection, but also reprocessing. So by changing the design of clothing, you can also already uh, foresee how this clothing, this piece of garment will be recycled and reused at the end of the life cycle. And finally, the fourth ambition relates to making effective use of resources, which is the basis of resource efficiency, but also adopting more renewable inputs. Now we will uh, look into the second part of the presentation, where uh, we will see together some trends uh, from the market, but also overall trends uh, with respect to the increasing demand of resource efficient and circular production processes in various industries, not just related to textiles. Um, but we will focus first on the big picture and then going into the textile and clothing sector. So one of the major trends which we have seen just now relates to the fact that raw materials, they are becoming scarce. So we can think of an example of water shortages in a country or in a specific region. Maybe you also have an example in your own region of water shortages happening, um, increasingly happening over the past years. And this such an issue, water shortage, could increase not only the water price, but also price related to electricity, uh, which has an obvious impact on the quality, the price, and also the availability of such resource, such input water. We can also think uh, on the global level, and also on the government level, how local and international environmental standards, they are becoming stricter. And there is a demand coming from buyers, from consumers, but also from local governments related to public procurement. Um, to uh, pretty much emphasize more or just give more priority to how companies are disposing their waste, how they're managing their effluent discharge, treating uh, uh, the waste and other resources. So definitely there is a demand that there that is not just coming from buyers, but also from governments. And next to that, we also need to think of consumers how they are increasingly asking for more transparency in relationship to poor producer clothes, but also which materials are included in that production, what are the impacts of the production on the environment, what are the working relations related to that production. So the consumers, they are also a major, um, yeah, they are a major agent of change and also uh, drivers of um, resource efficient and circular production practices. And finally, we also need to think on the environmental aspect related to climate change, which is a topic that is cross-cutting um, through all the sectors and industries and also all kinds of stakeholders. And it's uh, scientifically proved that we must reduce the environmental impact of activities in order also to uh, mitigate uh, and adapt to climate change impacts. So now we will look into the specific market trends related to textile and clothing sector. And the first one that we can see in the graph relates how the priorities of fashion brands have been changing over the years. And the data there is from 2017. What we see is that manufacturing, textile and clothing manufacturing, but also the consumption of raw materials are among the top priorities for fashion brands. That means that uh, they're extremely concerned of the continuity of their supply chains, 
but also on the environmental impacts and trying to find solutions of how to overcome those challenges, but also how to improve um, the production, the quality, but also reduce environmental impacts. So these are major priorities for uh, global value chains for international buyers. Then we also need to think, and I mentioned a bit just now, uh, the demand for this increased traceability in the supply chain, but also transparency with regard to information and the negative and also positive impacts related to production practices. And over the past years, there have been a couple of campaigns led by the civil society, but also by consumers. So there are big movements out there. There are many NGOs engaged in the topic, but also buyers and governments. Um, and I think the three questions that pretty much they uh, summarize in a very nice way, what do we talk, uh, what do we mean when we talk about traceability and transparency is, where, by whom, and how a garment is made, which raw materials are used to produce such garment, and what is the environmental impact. And, um, and then here we see also drivers, uh, the consumers, the NGOs, but also related to the complexity of the production networks. They are spread globally, but are also extremely fragmented. So with this opportunity of bringing more traceability and transparency, it comes a challenge also to, uh, to fully implement uh, appropriately in a way that covers all the geographies and fragmented supply chain. And moving to a third global market trend, when we look at international apparel companies, um, so if your company is interested or is considering exporting in the next years, or if you are already exporting, if you have plans to, uh, you should also consider what are the sustainability targets or what are the internal commitments that those companies, they have been um, taking over the years, which is a trend that is increasing. And we also see here in the graph uh, that over 90% of targets set by international companies, they cover environmental related impacts. So it's actually number one priority for global brands uh, to address the environmental issues related to their supply chains. And also some examples of companies that are already doing it, that have already made a commitment for instance, we see that the Inditex group, they aim to use 100% of sustainable cotton before 2025. So that's pretty, uh, pretty much a big commitment. And um, in order to achieve it, they, they surely are doing a lot of initiatives and also working with the suppliers um, in that end. And finally, the last global market trend that I would like to share with you um, relate to compliance with voluntary and private standards. Uh, we have seen over the past decades uh, an explosion like a, a very intense growth of these private standards related to sustainability. And companies, buyers especially, they are also investing in their own uh, their own standards, their own codes of conduct for suppliers. And many of them, they also relate to uh, resource management and environmental impact. So this is also a major trend. It's across all sectors. And uh, it also shows that companies like international buyers in engaging more deeply with their suppliers, uh, they are also aiming to improve compliance and the productivity and quality related to environmental uh, management. And now we like, we have seen a bit of the big picture related to resource depletion, environmental degradation. We have seen what is resource efficiency, circular production, how one is linked to the other 
uh, one contributes to the shift to a circular economy. We saw some market trends. Then the question is, okay, so what is the benefit for my company um, of adopting such resource efficient and circular production practices? So in a very, um, in, a, in sum, yeah, in a very, in a nutshell, we can say that becoming resource efficient is a way for companies also to manage their risks. Here we talk about risks related to the value chain, but also risks related to how companies interact with their stakeholders, shareholders, buyers, suppliers, customers, clients, workers. So for a business, there are different categories of risk that you need to manage, such as operational risks linked to inefficient use of resources and costs of production. We also have regulatory risks linked to stricter norms that could be also related to environmental management and also reputational risks because if you're not able to comply with the codes of conduct or with the requirements set by your international buyer, um, then chances are it will be harder to access those specific international markets that require certified operations. And also resource efficiency and circular production represent new business opportunities. Yes, yeah, so companies, they can increase their competitiveness and ensure business continuity by reducing production costs and also uh, decreasing their dependency with natural resources. As mentioned, also there is a strong connection with better regulatory and voluntary compliance, either from the private sector, but also from the government, yeah, related to legislation or perhaps uh, public procurement. So companies, they are also uh, able to, companies implementing RECP, they are uh, better prepared to meet environmental regulations and compliance with those buyer requirements. Also, when we think on the reputational aspect, it also leads to improved reputation, uh, not just only with buyers, but also if uh, your company um, is directly selling to consumers, there is also a chance that your reputation uh, and your consumer, um, your consumers, they will be somehow um, more compliant or they would, uh, they would be able to see what you have been doing. And um, that creates a lot of a consumer loyalty as well. And on the financial aspect, uh, there are also some opportunities to, of accessing finance uh, that are exclusive to environmental projects or environmental activities that a company decides to, uh, to operate or to adopt. So this is also an interesting area uh, for companies that are willing that at the moment is not implementing such kind of measures but are willing also to access finance in order to be able to implement them. And on that note, I will go to the third part of my presentation, which is to present some examples of resource efficient practices in the textile and clothing, TNC, uh, that actually led or have the potential to lead to cost savings and reduce resource consumption. These measures are not exhaustive, meaning that uh, there are other interventions that could be uh, applied in your company, depending on a baseline assessment, or could be applied in other uh, companies and sectors. And uh, all the measures that I will describe, that I will mention in this part, they are taken from um, an ITC project implemented in Ethiopia, uh, specifically with the textile and clothing sector. So we have worked with five companies 
last year to implement a very intense coaching program with each of them in order to identify, assess gaps related to resource use and management and come up with a business strategy for the companies to overcome such issues based on the cost benefit analysis of the measures to be implemented. So in a nutshell, the examples I'm going to show to you, they're all coming from Ethiopia, from a project that ITC has implemented last year. And I'll start actually with the water saving opportunities. So as you can see uh, in my slide, there are different examples of interventions that could be done by a company uh, in order to save uh, money, but also resources. For instance, uh, fixing water leakages from pipes and machines or recycling light polluted water from wet processing machines, recycle cooling water from textile wet processing, or even reusing final rinse water for, from dyeing, recovery of condensate water, recycle of diluted cost, uh, caustic soda solution, which is actually a measure that is combined with uh, better chemical management, and also shifting the AC input water from recycled water to raw water. So all these measures we have identified in, in this project in Ethiopia, and I will illustrate one specific measure so you can have an idea what was the intervention and also what was the potential cost saving and resource saving. So for instance, by conducting tests to identify leakage in the production facility and investing in fixing these faulty pipes, valves, joints, a company, uh, the company in case, company one, is able to save per year over 3,000 cubic meters of water. Yeah, so this is the potential annual water saving by making an investment cost of 1,550 US dollars. So it means that to implement this intervention to fix the water leakages, the company in that case, she would, uh, it would need to make an investment of $1,550 uh, and have a payback period of less than one year, meaning the company would recover the investment in less than a year. And the positive results are annual water saving and also financial savings, yeah, of over $3,000 per year. So this is the first example I would like to illustrate to show you that some measures that, as you can see here, they're not extremely costly, they can lead to annual savings and also resource savings. Now, uh, moving on to the energy resource, the energy sub area. Uh, also here, we, you can see a couple of examples of intervention areas to save energy and costs with electricity, firewood, but also fuel. Uh, for instance, we, the co companies, they could recover energy from the boiler system or save energy from insulating supply, condensate, and hot water lines. Companies could also recover energy um, from condensate and save actually energy from compressed air system and electrical power and lighting systems. And in the picture, what you see is actually the installation of a new efficient gas boiler that led to reduced consumption of energy, but also uh, reduced uh, costs with electricity bill. And now again, I will show you uh, more details on one of the measures and also the annual energy savings and the annual financial savings. So the measure that we see here is coming from insulating steam, condensate and hot water supply lines. So the company needed to uh, apply proper insulation to 
uh, lines that were not insulated or had a poor insulation. And the cost for such an intervention, as you can see, it really varies from company to company because these companies that have different sizes uh, and also like different uh, production lines. Uh, but what we see here is the investment cost for these five companies branch from just the over a thousand dollars US dollars to uh, over eight thousand dollars and with annual savings also ranging from three thousand dollars to almost twenty three thousand dollars savings from um, the electricity bills but also the consumption of uh, oil and firewood and in this specific case all companies they would have the investment uh, returned in less than a year so it means they would recover the initial investment in a very short time and I see there are some questions in the chat but I think I'll look at that a bit later um, and we will continue them with uh, the examples of measures and interventions. And now we are going to see a bit on the waste management. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. So there are many other opportunities for companies, but this is to give you an example of what could be done by a company. So here we see uh, two intervention areas. The first one relates to installation of a waste compactor to reduce the amount of sorted waste and the second one is recycling of sludge from uh from the water and i want to show you some pictures uh this example is actually coming from a company based in tunisia uh it's the demco group you can see the name at the bottom of the slide they have been implementing um, a waste management uh, process that is quite uh, interesting and also quite circular because actually what they do, they use part of the sludge coming from the wastewater treatment and they transform into pavement. So you can see the different steps they take in order to have this new product uh, being produced. Uh, they are now doing this with all the sludge coming from the wastewater, but uh, with the, the amount that uh, they actually are able to convert and transform, this also can generate some additional incomes for, uh, for the companies. So it can help companies actually to diversify their business opportunities. And finally, I also wanted to show you a bit of cost saving opportunities from chemical uh, management. Uh, we see three examples here. One relates to the avoidance of unnecessary chemical use. Um, so in every factory, uh, there, are, there is a list of uh, the necessary chemicals that should be used but also the amount of the chemicals is very important to take into account according to legislation and also to international benchmarks. A uh, second measure relates to recycling the caustic soda solution, which is also a measure that I mentioned before. This is very much related also to better water management practices. And a third uh, alternative could be also chemical saving from reducing the ETP load. And in the picture here, you see uh, the example of recycling the caustic soda drain. And I want to also show you uh, beyond the ideas of measures and intervention areas related to water, energy, uh, waste, and chemicals. I also want to give you a, a, a better picture of what could be the combined annual cost savings related to these measures. And this is a table coming from our project in Ethiopia with information about uh, the different companies that we worked with. And what you see here is in red, this is actually the potential of annual savings for all the five companies um, in a year. 
So this is about half million dollars that all these companies, uh, they would save by implementing this cost saving resource efficient measures. You can also have an idea of um, this cost, cost savings related uh, by resource. So on water, uh, the cost savings would be a bit over a thousand um, dollars per year. On energy, that's over $300,000 per year. And on chemicals is a bit less than uh, $35,000 $35, per year. So it's an interesting way also to see how better environmental management practices related to resource use and management, they can lead to very concrete results for a company and help them reduce their uh, costs. And very interesting information that I should not forget is we also see at the bottom of the table what would be the combined investment cost for these five companies to implement these measures and have this uh, potential saving? It's less than $150,000. So then you can also balance what is the opportunity of savings and what is actually the needed investment cost. And to finalize my presentation, I also want to show you the combined annual resource savings from this example in Ethiopia for the five companies that we have worked with. You uh, see in this table the combined resource savings per area from the implementation of these measures. And I think on that note, I conclude my presentation and we can start the last part, which is the Q&A. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Anna. That was really, really um, very uh, detailed and I think a lot of information and, and quite, uh, I think, uh, interesting interesting uh, sharing of, of, of data and our experiences on the, on the resource efficient and circular production uh, type type issues. So um, one thing I have to say, though, is, is that uh, we're a bit uh, over time. Uh, so what I would like, um, actually, what I'd like to do, I'd like to ask Anna, I think we have about six questions. I'm, I'm looking at the chat on my screen here. And we have about six questions that came in from uh, participants. What I'd like to do, Anna, is just to have you, if you can respond, uh, you know, in typing, uh, written, mm -hmm. or written, you know, respond to everyone with the answers to the questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. and that way um, we can respond to the people's questions but also we can then move on uh, with the next segment of the uh, of the webinar which is my colleague uh, my colleague Matthias Canape who will be speaking Matthias does not have a powerpoint so he'll just be providing some some comments um, I would just like to say two points one is is I, I from I'll take the liberty of responding to one of the questions that I think came from the municipality of Sanoval uh, via our colleagues at conserve uh, about you know how could ITC help in this area, and uh, I, my my very short response in terms of how we could help is that we have developed uh, online training of trainer materials right that we have been implementing with facilities uh, in lieu of traveling uh, because of the COVID situation, and um, if if there is any you know silver lining in this whole um, COVID nightmare is that we found that in, in many cases, um, the TOT work is actually quite effective and cost effective and can actually help uh, implement and get to a larger level of scale when it comes to these types of, 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 of methodologies and, and implementation of, of, the, of the various, let's say, uh, strategy development that Anna mentioned. So um, we'll be in touch with Conserve. And I also want to take this time to mention Conserve India as well. We have two colleagues from Conserve India, Anna and, uh, and, and Kanika Ahuja, who are on the line. Conserve India is an NGO based in Delhi, and they're working with us uh, as, as a kind of a coordinating and organizational partner to implement this project between ITC Ghent uh, and Sanoval in Ludhiana. So um, we will be in touch with, with our colleagues at Conserve going forward in terms of what we can think of doing vis-a-vis -vis an online type training uh, for the various um, for the various uh, industries and, 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 and suppliers that are interested. But for the rest of the questions, the five other questions that have come through on the chat, I'll ask Anna to, re to reply to those in a written way. 
and if we need to do something offline between uh, ITC and, and, and our colleagues online, then we can do that uh, at, a la at a later date. So without that, uh, without further ado, what I'll do is give the uh, speaker to my colleague, Matthias. Uh, welcome, Matthias, and uh, the floor is yours. And just if I could ask you to, um, you know, be a bit judicious in your, in, your, in your comments, just to make sure that we have enough time for uh, Varun and also then the, follow the, the final Q&A. Thank you. Not really responding anymore. Are you hearing me? You're a bit quiet, Matt, 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 Matthias. Can you maybe turn your volume up, maybe, or maybe closer to the mic? Sorry. Not even closer to the mic, but my computer is somehow on standby now. I can't uh, control the mouse anymore, so I try to speak louder. Okay, this is better. It's better, though. It's okay. Okay. So we're switching now to resource, um, from resource efficiency to COVID-19. And I give you a little overview of uh, of some global uh, global happenings in uh, with regard to COVID-19 and the clothing uh, sector, but also a little bit on cotton and textiles because it's important for for India too. Uh, we all know know that uh, uh, revenues of the global fashion industry is going down. So McKinsey estimates 27 to 30 percent uh, 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 for 2020. Uh, and this is because you no know, end consumer retail sales have very been very heavily disrupted. As, uh, shops are opening now, where we are in Switzerland to some extent in Europe, but not in all the markets yet. And uh, uh, since shops are not open, and uh, people also uh, losing jobs, consumer spending is down in the markets. So if you look in German markets, where I come from, for example. Uh, fashion retail turnover in, in March was minus 60%. It was minus 76% in April. It was still 29% uh, down in May. And even in, in the first weeks of June, it's still down uh, 36%. If you look in the US market, uh, uh, figures came just out for April. Uh, consumer spending for clothing is down 48%, so almost half. Uh, if you look then in some of the sales figures coming out from the, the big brands, uh, you, you, you see this, they don't sell anymore. H&M brought out the, the figures for January to May. It's minus 50%. Initex had figures out for the first quarter. It's down 46%, so almost half. And uh, uh, many people believe that's, that's to be re that remains the case in the next couple of months since uh, consumers like us with full wardrobes, we regard uh, clothing as not necessarily an essential item to buy right now. Uh, uh, we need to, to use our money otherwise. You may think online purchases can compensate, not necessarily, even online sales are down. Yes, somehow uh, it, uh, it goes up for certain, but for, for, for others not. Uh, but it certainly cannot uh, co compensate for the, uh, the reduction in brick and mortar sales. Uh, and if you look at some of the, re uh, the, the retailers and brands you may be working with, Primark, for example, is a big uh, a retailer, does not even sell anything on the internet. Eh? So, uh, but nevertheless, people and, and, and the brands moving into it. So, uh, Initex has just announced that they are, and I think, investing several hundred millions of, of, of euros into building up the internet sales. This ev evaporation of consumer demand uh, leaves the retailers and brands with large inventories. What to do with them? Uh, it's a big problem for sustainability if they are not uh, sold. Some stuff are sold at discounted prices. And if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, uh, the apparel uh, prices adjusted in the US, which just came out, uh, uh, they are down 2% in March, uh, down 5% in April, and 2.5% in May as compared to last year. So prices are falling even in the market. And if you look then, bring this into to, towards uh, 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 the imports, uh, figures for, for the US in April were clothing imports were down 45%. And if you look in the EU market, uh, they, they brought out the first quarter, it's also about, about 5% overall, with the woven, woven garments uh, have more heavily affected than, than the knit garments. So all this for companies is a demand shock because you're, you're experiencing it. 
your clients, your brands and retailers are passing the shock on to you by canceling orders. So some do this uh, responsibly, some others do not do this necessarily responsibly. But those orders are canceled, that are produced, that are on the ship, for which the fabric have been cut. Uh, uh, but also there is a demand for for extended permit, uh, payment terms, the uh, 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 demand reduction of, 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 of the order price, and what have you. So lots of countries, India, I'm not not so sure how much, but they just write public. Your neighboring country, uh, Bangladesh, for example, has been very uh, vocal on on the impact of these of these on uh, on the sector in terms of how many companies are involved, how many, but the value of, uh, of, of orders affected. So uh, we're talking about in Bangladesh, about 1,150 companies by the end of April affected by these cancellations, versus an amount of 3.2 billion US dollars uh, and affecting about 2.3 million workers. But also other regions are, are vocal. So in East, uh, Southeast Asia, some of the associations came together uh, uh, to to make this public, also put some pressure from their side on on brands and retailers. The the, the Turks did this, uh, uh, and and some others. So this puts on you if you're a garment manufacturer a lot of pressure in terms of how can I reduce my costs, how can I find alternatives, how can I uh, uh, find additional finance that, that that that's needed for survival. I'll come to this a little later. Uh, some of the companies are also experiencing a supply shock. It's not so much India, it's not so much uh, Ljubljana, because you have your fabric base there. But many of your competitors, uh, we heard about Ethiopia before, the, all the competitors in Central Asia for the US market, uh, in North Africa for the EU market, they do not have textiles. They need to import the textiles. And some of the uh, uh, sources they have, they're also under confinement. So they have difficulties in getting the fabrics. Uh, if they still have orders, they have difficulties to get the fabrics uh, uh, to the to be some garments for the And then of course you have the, the problem of the confinement. Garments uh, are crowded places. Uh, uh, how can you ensure uh, social distancing in, in the production line? So a difficult, uh, and that's why many of the companies have been shutting down. You have examples uh, from Guatemala, which was made public uh, quite a lot, where a whole factory was basically infected uh, because people were, were passing the, the virus on a, 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 at the factory, uh, factory floor. Overall, uh, in textiles, consumers don't buy, brands don't buy from you, you don't Prime from textile manufacturers and more to your garment manufacturers. Also, sales worldwide for say, for for textiles dropped about about a third. And then, if you in, in terms of India, not so much Ludhiana, but nevertheless, it also has then a, a, a knock-on effect on the cotton sector, where uh, no, cotton prices have been falling about 25%. If you look at the the A index, for example, which has a big problem then for for cotton farmers and and, and the supply base, also in the longer term, right? because Mill use is what I can set out yesterday is uh, is reducing over the next couple of years. So we have a more production than you have uh, uh, mill use. So prices will further go down. So what can you do? I'm, I'm not looking at the watch, uh, Joe. So give me another two minutes. Uh, what can we? No problem. What can what quick? What can you do? What I mentioned earlier, no? If you are what uh, uh, what is one of the major problems I see uh, right now is okay, where I get the finance from? How can I reduce my costs? And uh, what are some new opportunities? So, but we work on with in the projects we are working on is, is, is helping you no know, companies to uh, access existing financing mechanisms, which are not always known. Also, many company countries have brought out uh, stimulus packages also for the textile clothing industry, but it's not always easy for the companies to know about it and then uh, comply with the, with the uh, requirements of, of, the, of, the, of the central bank and then the banks that apply the finance. Um, other things which are important is, okay, 
finance is one thing, but at the same time, you need to reduce your costs. So cash flow management is a big uh, issue we we'll need to address. Many of the companies need to address. There's a lot of things you can, you can gain from. Uh, we work a lot with companies in many countries, right? Not, not in India, but in many countries. Um, uh, lean manufacturing is still a very important aspect uh, uh, in order to put the, the, the processes in place. Uh, but then you have the additional complexity of social distancing. So how can you restructure your factory floor in order to allow this? Because your buyer will also would like you to address this issue because they're looking at environmental aspects and social and labor aspects. You now have the, the additional complication of social distancing. So how can you make sure that your workers are safe against the virus? So you, you need to, in, in, the, in the manufacturing approach, you need to find a way to also address the social distancing. Uh, just a little outlook into to the market. Uh, uh, what we see coming, or not tomorrow morning, but uh, uh, in the medium term, is industry consolidation. It has been going before. It continues to go. You see lots of retailers, a lot of your brands and uh, clients are uh, uh, shutting down. So we will have probably a consolidation of, of the retail sector. So larger buyers, what do they do? Do they buy from larger clients, from larger factories? Do they still continue buying with small with SMEs? That need to be seen, but it's certainly a challenge for SMEs. We see also the need for diversification on the brand side, especially coming closer with them to the market. So near shoring, something that already started before the uh, uh, confinement and for, before the uh, uh, the C19 uh, shock is going to probably to accelerate, which is not favorable for India. It's probably favorable for North Africa, Eastern Europe for the European market, Central America for the US markets. So you also need to find uh, somehow a response to this. Digitization is a big thing. Uh, and digitization is a very complicated thing. Huh? It's not only about, yes, if you have your own product, if you don't do CMT, if you don't do FOB, if you have your own collection and designs, then you can use probably e-commerce locally, starting to, and then maybe in the, in the market. Uh, uh, but if you don't, then you need to digitize, and you can't sell online, basically, but you need to digitize your supply chain, your, your entire operations. But uh, you cannot just use digital means for a process that is not optimal. So it's going back to lean manufacturing. Only if you're really lean, does digitization make a sense? Because you want to digitize a lean operation. Um, and then overall, uh, I think uh, um, additional op op opportunities lie in less and less, but there will be a need for so, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. I saw some comments on, on, on non movements So there will be a, a larger market at the same time. Many of your markets also trying to be self-sufficient now. Uh, how this will be over the long run, I'm not sure because I don't believe that everybody should produce everything. It doesn't really make any sense. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the initial opportunity of, okay, can we now uh, uh, sell PPE is closing down somehow because all the countries switching. So it's, it's, it's a lesser market now. But there's the local market. Uh, uh, for you also, and uh, um, I think this is something in the short term to look at. Joseph, I think I've over, uh, overspent already time, so I leave it at this. If there's any comments and questions, great. Uh, good rest. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. Thanks very much for that. That's the very, very insightful um, observations on your on your part and, and from your experience working in the field and um, yeah, grateful for, for that. I think what we'll do is we're gonna hold the Q&A until after Varun, so I wanna make sure that Varun has a chance to also um, also present. So um, those of you who have questions for Matthias, please do uh, compose them in the chat like you did for Anna. Uh, and then, um, yeah, now we'll turn the, turn the floor uh, to Varun for your intervention. So thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thank you for uh, giving this opportunity. So I'll be, uh, presenting about the impact of uh, COVID on Indian apparel market. 
So I have just a small presentation. I like to you. Uh, I like to take uh, everyone through this presentation. Uh, so on the similar lines that uh, what uh, Mathias has been speaking about that uh, uh, what is the current status in India and after that uh, which are the factors that we think that will drive the consumption change we are also seeing a shrinkage in the local consumption in, in India so what are the factors we see that it is a duration of the lockdown the pace of the recovery and consumer sentiment and what is the way forward for Indian manufacturers. Uh, so if you look at the uh, status of COVID-19, we, we know that uh, after uh, going into lockdown on 24th March, since 8th June, uh, there have been uh, some kind of relaxation which have been given, but uh, the cases of COVID are continuously increasing. While uh, the marketplaces and in theory have been opened, they, have, they are allowed to function, but the footfall of consumer is really, really low. Uh, public transportation between states is specially affected. And factories are also facing a lot of worker shortage, even in Ludhiana also. Uh, many of the factories are forced to run with only one third of capacity or one half of 50% uh, of their capacities. And uh, the projections which were there, which are there for the GDP for India, earlier they were positive. We were, we were expecting that in 2020, India will uh, regain its growth rate in the range of 6.5 to 7%. But due to COVID, the uh, recent projections which has come are showing that India could, India's economies could, could actually shrink this year. So that's again uh, going to impact on the consumer sentiment as well. So uh, what are the factors that are driving the consumption change in Indian markets? So three things, as I talked about, duration of lockdown, uh, pace of market recovery, and consumer sentiment. If we lock, uh, talk about the uh, duration of lockdown, uh, we understand because of psychologically uh, also, longer the lockdown, slower will be the uh, sales recovery. Just a minute. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I think there is some problem, please. please keep it. Yeah. So uh, we are somewhere in the 75-day uh, lockdown period where uh, after 75 lockdown, we, under, we expect that the markets will go back to the 60 to 70% of normal sales in next 50 days. Had it been uh, a shorter lockdown, let's say of 40 days, the recovery period could have been also shorter to an extent of 30 days. But what has happened even if uh, even after opening of 75 days lockdown, actually uh, not all restrictions have gone. So effectively it could be somewhere in the range of 75 to 100 day lockdown. So the net impact on sales for any retailer would be in the range of 125 to 150 days at least. So that's going to be the total impact in terms of days. So almost five months of sales will be impacted on the retail level. Uh, uh, on, the, on the pace of recovery, definitely different segments have different utility, durability, and unit cost. If you talk about apparel, uh, thankfully, we are in a segment which is expected to make recovery faster than the other goods. For example, uh, if you talk about automotive sector, their utility is not on a, on a regular basis for basic needs, and the durability is also very high, and the unit cost is extremely high when compared to apparel. So apparel being a kind of a basic necessity, even a home textile and footwear. So these are the commodities which we are expecting will recover faster than the other things. And if you talk within apparel, what we are seeing here is that uh, some of the basic categories uh, will recover faster. For example, casual wear, ethnic wear, kids wear, lounge wear and inner wear compared to the categories such as formal wear and party evening occasion wear. Uh, even uh, two weeks ago, there was, a, there was an article in the news. People were saying that the kids wear retailers specifically were talking that their, their, their merchandise is uh, flying off the shelf. And since the lockdown has opened, uh, people are actually buying, stockpiling their clothes because when we went into lockdown, almost the winters were ending. Now the summers have started. So for younger kids, when there's a, there is a demand for size change, etc. So there is a big demand of garments specifically in the kids wear. Similarly, in the casual wear segment, people, a lot of corporates are, are, are doing work from home, are allowing work from home. So people are preferring casual wear or comfort lounge wear rather than, you know, formal wear. So these are the categories that we see will be recovering faster than the other ones. On the consumer sentiment side, uh, we actually conducted a survey of uh, almost 1700 consumers uh, online across India. And some of the key findings that I would like to share is first of all, 58% of the consumers reported that they are quite eager to shop post lockdown, but 60% of them said that they will actually reduce spending on apparel. So that's a, that's a kind of a, a red flag for the apparel industry. And nearly half of the consumers claim their low eagerness for fashion engagement owing to decrease in socializing. So there are no occasions, the parties, marriages, etc. Nothing is happening as of now. So the fashion segment of the value chain is, is specially impacted. Uh, only 35% consumer believe that they have enough clothes and don't need to shop for apparel. Majority need the apparel on an on a, on a immediate basis. 
and approximately 65% consumers were willing to buy comfortable clothing that cuts across work from home as well as the stay for home. So this is the mapping that we did that how the consumption on a monthly basis will look like for this fiscal year starting from April 20 to March 21. I'll not go into too much of detail because we have a paucity of time. But broadly speaking, uh, uh, we are projecting that because we are in the range of 75 to 100 day lockdown. So the net consumption will be in the range of 65% to somewhere around 55% on a, on a year to year basis. So last year, if, we're, if the total market was 100, so this year it will be only be 55 to 65 uh, kind of a level. So what does this mean that apparel retail, which stood in, uh, which stood in fiscal year 20, it was almost $74 billion. Now this year it will be in the range of 49 billion to maybe 39 million dollars so that's a total reduction of 35 to 45 percent on the apparel retail side uh, so coming to the last section what is happening uh, what are the emerging trends so that's that's kind of a, a reiteration of the trends that uh, you know uh, Matthias has spoken earlier and even Anna has uh, spoken a lot on the product trends so just quickly I'll go through it first of all on the consumer side health hygiene and safety is the top concern for anybody so if there is a product which is directly addressing these concerns, so then definitely the demand is higher. Uh, consumers are having more online presence uh, in last few weeks. People who have never purchased online, a lot of people who have never never purchased anything online or even buying groceries online. So the, the penetration of online uh, retailers have uh, grown very, very fast. Uh, they are cutting down on discretionary expenditure. There, are, there have been layoffs from the companies. There have been salary cuts, etc. And people are also not confident about the uh, next few months. So there is a uh, clear visible cut on the discretionary expenditure. The need of home wardrobe, I've already discussed, comfortable smart casuals are the, ones pro are the products which consumer is looking these days. Uh, retail trend, uh, rapid growth of e-commerce and internationally we are also hearing an advent of uh, uh, slow fashion instead of fast fashion. So people are talking that fast fashion not only contributes to uh, negatively impact the sustainability, sustainability aspect of the value chain, but also in these kind of scenarios where the supply chain is specifically stressed out. So maybe moving down to slow fashion could be a viable option. So some things, some progress is being seen on those lines. Uh, in sourcing trends, people are actively looking to invest in sourcing beyond China. How much they can do that, that's a, that's a question that requires a, a great level of discussion, but there's a clear demand. Even Japan declared that they will be supporting or facilitating their companies to move out of China and set up base somewhere else. Uh, technical collaborations globally because of this will be will be visible in, in days to come and digital solutions for contactless interaction between buyers and suppliers whether in terms of uh, the product approval or order placements or you know uh, uh, I would say product design as well as the finalization of order a lot of digital solutions are will be visible very soon in the product trends uh, apart from antimicrobial finish of course circular textiles we've talked at length about it and sustainable uh, fiber, sustainable dyes, and sustainable technology-based products are the ones that people are going to uh, uh, to be demanding more and more in the future. So uh, the last slide, what does it mean? Like all we have seen, what Indian companies can do to weather this corona uh, storm and how, how we can come out stronger. So there are seven basically items that we need to think about. It again is a kind of a uh, extension of what people have been, what we have discussed in the earlier presentation. So first and foremost is focus, focusing on manufacturing excellence or lead manufacturing. Because the point is that China is now at a juncture where they are also realizing that they could lose the market share globally. So there is uh, in, in all, uh, in all, possi it's all uh, possible, uh, possibility that China can again lower down its prices and it could again try to regain the market share. So people, even if we are competitive, for example, in cotton yarn, India is extremely competitive. In cotton fabrics, we are very competitive. In, in women's fashion, we are where there's a lot of value added handwork. We are very competitive, but we can't be complacent at this point in time. We need to focus on manufacturing excellence to reduce our costs and to be more competitive and, and not only retain, but add to our existing uh, global market share. Second is focus on synthetics and winter wear. We know that uh, first of all, the calendar year has already gone. Now when the global markets open, the buyers will be placing order for winter wear or synthetics. And India is specifically very not very well known on these two categories. And if we want to increase our share, if we want to uh, do better, uh, perform better than the current levels and synthetics and winter wear is to be is to be the focal area. Uh, when we say that people are looking to buyers are looking to move out from China. So they when they move out of China, they want to have scale. But unfortunately, in India, we do not have larger companies. So one solution could be a kind of a virtual integration level, uh, something like a hub and spoke model, 
where anchor led uh, anchor investor takes the onus of interacting directly with the buyers with, uh, you know ensuring the order placement etc and in turn has a lot of vendor base within its uh, within its gambit who can who can manufacture and supply to the anchor and then the relation can start so it's a kind of a virtual integration which will give the anchor a lot of capacities without direct investment fourth uh, point is to committed and reliable for on time deliveries that's one of the biggest challenge for indian uh, manufacturers whether it is for the global market or for the indian market so we are uh, the companies are not very reliable or committed so sometimes buyers have already also complained that even our emails uh, the response time you know is is as bad as one week even so these are not the times these are actually the times that we should look into where our weaknesses and leverage our strengths so this is an important aspect fifth point is that uh, we need to also look at, uh, beyond us and eu these markets almost 60% of our exports of our parallel exports goes to us and eu but there are larger markets for example japan japan imports almost 28 billion dollar worth of apparel but our share there is only 280 million dollars and and it's a, it's an irony because we have a duty free access to japan uh, plus there are almost like 10 billion dollar uh, uh, importers such as australia canada switzerland so these are the countries where india has not uh, you know been able to penetrate so far so beyond looking beyond us and eu can also support our exporter export fraternity six is uh, we the indian companies also need to capitalize on healthcare textile and uh, definitely we know in ludhiana a lot of healthcare textile aprons gowns masks have been uh, manufacturing has started so that's one of the one of the good uh, things that has happened in recent past that we have emerged as one of a leading supplier of uh, the healthcare textiles uh, in 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 the, the world however there is a big big lacuna in terms of the standardization and certification as of now and that is the area that people need to focus on if they want to make it a kind of a sustainable business in a long term and the seventh uh, last but not least is the we there is a clear cut requirement to partner with international firms for technical and market know how all said and done we are for example if if seventh point i'm talking about so all the previous six can be a part of seven so if we are partnering with an international firm then we can expect to learn from it the best practices we can expect that they are in a category where we are not very strong they they could help us achieve scale and the practices can help us improve on all aspects whether it is uh, market footprint or technical know how or new product diversification so everything is there so i think uh, with this i would like to end my uh, presentation here and if is there a, there is any other question uh, we can take it up as uh, you know jo you can take it over from now yeah. very very good thank thanks so much varun for for your interventions and the and the great the great information and data uh, i think that was a very succinct presentation and really do i really do appreciate your um, your your input so uh, we do have uh, i'm looking at the clock uh, we have about 10 minutes which is actually quite good so um if there are any questions for varun or uh for matias uh, on the specific issues related to uh the sector uh vis-a-vis -vis what we're facing now with covid uh please do um you know please do write them in the chat uh we also now also because we have some time we we could also have a a a, a verbal uh, q and a so if anyone wants to unmute their microphone and ask a question uh that 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 verbally that's fine uh, we can do that um likewise uh i i know my colleague anna battaglione is still on the line here so if there's any questions that come from the first part of the presentation we can also uh we can also discuss those so i'll i'll leave the floor open uh to anyone that wants to um intervene with a with with the with a question for any of our speakers yeah matias go ahead you want to say something i see that your name's on the board here No, 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 that's fine. I switched to my telephone now. <laughs> okay. I have to use it. Okay. Uh, and I was just, uh, and, I, and I have been just corrected uh, that we actually are over by 10 minutes. You know, I'm sorry. So <laughs> I forgot about that. I'm looking at my clock, which is not the, which is, I forgot that India is a half hour ahead. So I'm sorry about that. Um, indeed, we're over, we're over 10 minutes. So um, I guess, If there are no further questions, uh, then what I'll do is I will uh, bring the the webinar to a close. Just to let you know that uh, we are we are recording this, and so we'll make the recording available through a, a web link, and, and we will have that 
uh, disseminated through our, our, our partners. So through Conserve, we'll also uh, have a copy uh, that, that can be sent to, uh, to Wazir as well. So this can be shared amongst the entire uh, community. So thanks again for everyone for participating today. I uh, want to thank especially my colleague Anna Battaglione for her presentation on the, on the resource efficient circular production practices. I want to thank my colleague Matthias Canape for his, his inputs and also our colleague Varun Baid from Wazir from, for the great presentation. So I think a lot of information was packed into the session. I hope that everyone uh, enjoyed uh, the, the, the discussion, the virtual, the virtual discussion that we had. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us uh, should you require any more information uh, on any of our respective programs or, or work in this field. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great uh, rest of your day and uh, we'll see you, uh, see you shortly again online. We'll, we're also planning a, um, a workshop, likely obviously a, vir a virtual workshop toward the end of the summer or early part of, um, of the fall. And we will um, also to consolidate these different learnings that we're taking and we'll make sure that everyone who's on our mailing list is aware of, 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 the, of the dates for that. So uh, stay tuned and thanks again. All the best everyone, bye-bye.